question is about the project that has been mentioned a series of times yesterday and today during economics. And I'll leave you with Eileen and Carlos. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So today we're going to be showing you um, the doing economics projects. So these are empirical projects for ESPP and the economy, but they're not just for ESPP and the economy. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Whoa, that was loud. <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah, it's meant to be for the sound. Yeah, so this was done, so I'm in charge of the Excel versions, and then Ralph, who sadly couldn't be here, is in charge of the R versions. He has a video that we're going to show you later. So it's just meant to introduce you to the projects, and it's for you to assess whether you think it's a viable resource for you to use in your teaching. So to start off, uh, to wake us all up from lunch, so in, with people next to you, just discuss how you're using empirical data right now in your teaching. So for what purpose and what kinds of data you're using. So we'll break into groups and then we'll report back later. Yeah. How many people per group? Uh, just with the people next to you. So two, three, four. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry to interrupt your, uh, your discussion, but I think it's time to feed back into the group now. So, is there anyone who'd like to start off the discussion? Um, anyone would like to start off with sharing anything? Yeah, so I think we can um, categorize the, the courses in two groups. Uh, one where we use data more as an illustration, um, and one where data is really the focus point, and that's more the statistical courses and the data analysis courses. Uh, and I think, yeah. We were a bit mixed. And the visualization uh, course, yeah, indeed. Um, so two types of courses where we use data. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anyone else want to share anything else? We were discussing how much we use, I think we all, us three at least, use, use data as part of the core project. You know, in, in part of the teaching core as part of the principal things, and mainly based on Excel. Um, but actually, a, a question arose out of that, which is that, um, I use the data from core, which is only available as a teacher's resource, as I understand it. Uh, it isn't actually directly available to the students, is that correct? But any teacher is able to make it available to any student if they so choose. Yes, <laughs> that, that's true. But that, so it is okay to do, to keep... Absolutely. Yeah, right. Yes. Um, but we should be doing more, of course. <laughs> macro is that students, we talk about GDP, inflation and employment, and once I gave the students, can you please look at data of GDP, they go to the World Bank data set and say, just look for the data, show it, and they panic because they say, well, you know, once it's, I say GDP, but there are 10 different measures of GDP that I haven't looked at and choose the right measure, so it's not just using the data, but sometimes making the students find the data and clean the data set is something that I think we do less and something I would like to kind of make them work more mm -hmm. on that. Which is going to be more important for when actually they're going to go to work rather than just having the data set and doing a metric analysis. I mean, I might just, sorry, I might just have a comment because I don't, I'm not a teacher, I work at the UK Stats <laughs> Office. Um, and I think there's probably two points I'd make. Uh, I think one, um, and please feel free to correct me, but I think my experience with a lot of the students who have come in as graduate economists, they don't really have a basic understanding of like, what's going on in the UK economy in terms of you know, headline measures. Uh, I appreciate there's a lot of information there, but um, things like you know, the underlying growth rate or unemployment or inflation, that seems to be a little bit missing, and they really pick it up on day one. Um, I think that's one observation. I think they, the second one would be response to that point, which it's not easy. I mean, I... It's very rare where I go a day without, you know, when I tell someone from the ONS and they don't ask me about the website and the state of that. Um, so I know it's not easy for students to, you know, it's not easy for me to find some of those numbers, let alone someone who's brand new to that area. So I think there's definitely uh, a role for ONS to be much more user friendly and make it much more accessible, th those numbers. But I think if you can kind of integrate it, I suppose, with how it's being taught, I would hope there's some kind of, uh, uh, I guess, a virtuous cycle there. Yeah, um, any other points before we move on? Right. That wasn't an action, I hope. I mean, I can, I can take it back at least. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Right, so there were a lot of interesting points that were raised that I'm hoping that today's presentation uh, will discuss. So there's issues with like cleaning the data, with measurement, getting students to engage with the data and using the data more in teaching. And I think that in that case, like doing economics is for you. In which, um, so some background about the project is, this is taken straight from the Doing Economics website that Wendy was showing you yesterday. So basically students, teachers, and citizens have all complained loudly about the gap between what is current, commonly taught in economics and these important and fascinating empirical questions. So what we, why we started doing economics was to close the gap. So sometimes teachers will give students like a toy data set to play with and they're not really answering any real questions. Um, so what we were, aiming to do is to get students playing with real data and answering real questions, even with really basic statistics and concepts. So our hope is that the doing economics will not only be used by courses based on ESPP and the economy, uh, but also by any student of economics or social science, especially where quantitative policy analysis is a useful skill. So this is relating back to some points that were raised earlier about employability. So it's also meant to be used as a resource for anybody who wants to self-study, so to learn more about how to use Excel and how to use R. Um, so if, even if you can't adopt the SPP or the economy, you can still adopt doing economics. Um, so. Our aim is to introduce students to the art, practice, and excitement of using data to understand economics and policy analysis. So that's the overarching aim. Um, but to make it more concrete, there's a few points. So what we, will, what we do is we provide hands-on experience with real-world data to investigate important policy problems. So I'll give some more specifics on that later. And then we would also like to strengthen the link between real world phenomena and economic concepts and models. So when students will learn about things like supply and demand in class, then the students can also play with supply and demand and plot their own supply and demand curves in Excel or R, for example. And also back to the employability. So helping students develop skills that are transferable to other courses and to the workplace. Um, so for example, if they're moving on to do econometrics courses later, then they'll have the skills that they need and also in the future for employability. Um, so the principles behind these projects is we'd like to, we, we're providing a step-by-step -step guide of how to go from the raw data, so from when they download it off of a website, to answering some interesting questions. So we will show students the details for workings in Rx and Excel. So I'll give you a walk through the website later so you can see what I mean by details for workings. But we want to really take students by the hand because they might not know anything except how to enter in data in Excel, and maybe not even that. So we assume that students don't really have any knowledge about Excel or R, or even statistics. So as long as they have GCSE math at grade C or above, which is the minimum requirement to enter a UK university, then they can do these projects. So just to, uh, an important point is that they're not a course in R and Excel per se, but they are interesting opportunities for to practice. So if you find one project that particularly is applicable to your teaching. You don't have to take students through, you know, one, one, two, three, four in order. You can just pick and choose. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. All right, so here are some of the interesting questions that we discuss, and these are just the first four projects. So project one, this is about climate change and the environment. So students are use um, carbon dioxide emissions data and global temperature data from NASA. And they are answering, they are looking at how obvious the correlation is between like temperature anomalies and carbon dioxide emissions over time. So this talks a bit about correlation versus causation and also just how to represent data in graphs. Um, and then this is where our students, so this is the second project and then they're playing a public goods game. So they play a game in groups and then they gather the data so they can see how data is collected and entered into Excel. So it's not just a magical document that appears with these numbers and they don't know where they come from. So students can see the, how, what their actions can translate into things that are later used in analysis. So here they play a public goods game and then they look at data with that some researchers have collected by doing public goods experiments in different countries. And then they see there's two different, con there's sort of experimental conditions that change where people can punish each other now. So they can learn that interventions are necessary, can be necessary in some situations in, to maintain contributions. Uh, and then this is the third project. So they look at the sugar tax. So there was in, that happened in the city of Berkeley. So they're looking at the prices of tax and non-tax goods. So this uses a natural experiment to show students that how, how a sugar tax can increase prices, but also 
uh, the concepts behind natural experiment. Um, and then project four is about measuring well-being. So this was an issue that was raised yesterday about, well, CORE should talk a bit more about well-being. So here's a project about that. So they look at different ways that you can compare living standards across countries and time. So it's not just GDP, but also the HDI. And then students can create their own index that they think would re better represent living standards and use that to rank countries. So these are some examples of things that you could, that students might be interested in and would also want to learn how to do. Okay, so now it's time to do a walk through the site. Um, so this is the core website, so it's coreecon.org, the site that we all know and love. So here, um, if you just go to the fourth circle, that's where you can find the Doing Ec Economics site. So if you just click and get started, you can see, um, click read now. So then all the things that I said are in the preface and the note to instructors. So there's a bit more detail that you can read um, but here's the general structure of a project. So you've got, there's nine of them, so they are, there's learning objectives. So they're clearly defined, so students will know these are statistical cons to do with statistical concepts and data presentation. Uh, so they will see what they'll be learning. And then for instructors, there's things that students need to know before doing the project. So if they don't know the mean, median, decile, you will have a bit of difficulty teaching them this project. Um, and then here are some the concepts that will be introduced in the project. Um, so then in the introduction, they have we, we motivate the project. So discussing the client, for example, in this climate change example, we're saying, oh, we've grown a lot, but there are some consequences on the environment. So then here are some the research questions that as a, suppose you're a policy advisor, here are some research questions that you might want to be looking at. So this is getting to the sort of policy analysis. Uh, and then we'll, we explain how we're going to use data to answer these questions. So students can read through that. Um, and then you can see here how it links to ESPP and the economy. So, right, so then there's two options, so working in Excel and working in R. So the R one, Wendy walked through a little bit yesterday, so I'm gonna focus on the Excel one now. So the Excel and R, the tasks are as identical as we could get because there are some things that you can do easily in Excel and they're harder to do um, and vice versa in R. So we try to make them as similar as possible and there's only one set of solutions. Um, so for the working in Excel, so there's different parts. You can see that there's different parts of the project. You've got, there's one part and then there's a, 1.2 and 1.3. So the parts generally can be done independently of each other. So if you're afraid that, oh, well, I'll have to do this whole project with my students and I don't know how many hours it's going to take, uh, you can pick and choose different parts of the project that um, suit your course, basically. So here we, so the aim of this part is to get students to plot this graph. And if they've never done Excel before, this can be something very scary. Uh, but when this was piloted, I think the, um, in, uh, Birkbeck University, there is a lecturer who got their students to do that and they thought it was very rewarding uh, because they had a clear output at the end of the session. Um, so if the students are doing it by, so by themselves, you can see here, so there's like a link to the website. So if you click on that, then the website will show up. So this is the link to the data. So they're downloading the raw data and it tells you where to click to get it. Um, and then before the students even do anything with the data, then they have to, we, ask them, they have to understand what the data means. So then instead of doing temperature and levels, this has temperature and anomalies, which is like deviations from the mean. So again, if students don't know mean, this is a problem. Uh, so then students have to read something and then answer what the data is actually measuring before they actually do anything with it. So it's trying to get students to think more about what they're actually doing and what the data measures. Um, right, so then after they've thought about these issues, then they will plot a line chart. So here um, is an example of what we've prepared to walk the students through. So this is what I mean by like step-by-step -step guides and working shown. So these are annotated screenshots um, to show them how to do this part of the question. So if they don't know anything about Excel, it's very, so it, there's the captions at the bottom, so it's telling sort of a <coughs> brief description of the data. And then here it just tells them what buttons in Excel to click. So this is in Excel 2016, the latest version. So it just tells them which things to click and in which order to get the output so they can see what they've done. And then there are some confirmation at the bottom here. So say, oh, so after completing step four, you're going to get a line chart that looks like that. And if it doesn't, then you've done something wrong. Um, so they, they can sort of 
it walks the students through how to do everything. So this is the graph that was shown earlier, so how to get them to add a, a line here and then to move the axes down. So all the steps, it walks them through step by step. Um, so that's how we do the Excel walkthrough. So then these are to show students all the new things. So if they have to draw another line chart, we don't show them the thing again. Um, right, so that's a brief walk through, through the projects. Um, and then at the end of the project, you can, so there's solutions here. Um, so you can see there's example answers for the, and these will also be available for students. So if they're working through the exercises on their own, then they can check that they've got the right answer. Um, so if you're planning, if you're thinking of using them as a for, uh, the projects as a form of <coughs> assessment, it can still be done even though there are solutions because, for example, you can just ask them to pick another month to do the graph. So the chart will look different, but the concept is the same. So I think these projects are quite flexible and we can discuss that. We'll be discussing that a bit more later. So that's just the website. So you can explore it more on your own. So slide show, good slide. So that was the walk through the site. Okay, so the basic structure. So here's an, another example. So the sugar tax thing that I was mentioning early, earlier. So they are using a store price data that was also used in a journal article. And they'll just make frequency tables um, comparing products before and after the tax. And then they're comparing mean prices before and after the tax and then doing a line chart of product prices over time. And then you can like before and after the tax and you can kind of see where the prices start increasing. Um, and then they'll read the journal article that uses this data. Um, and then they'll describe, so they can, they'll understand how the authors got this data, which was basically by going to different stores and then surveying people. Um, and then evaluating the choice of comparison stores and then interpreting p-value. So there's a bit of hypothesis testing in there too. Um. <laughs> right, so this, these are all the tasks that the students can do um, in a project. Okay, so in terms of linking the projects to your teaching, here's a table which shows the 12 different projects that we will have. Currently, we only have until nine uh, as live, and then the links to the ESPP units and links to the economy units. So if you're using core in your teaching, then you can already see the correspondence. Uh, and then in the t there's all the different topics in case you haven't had a chance to look at the website. So I'll just give you a few seconds to digest this information. <laughs> so in all of these cases, the data is downloaded off of some website and it's publicly available and accessible just to show students the range of data that's available. So for example, here we're using like Ethiopian survey data from the World Bank. Um, in some cases, we have to clean the data. So like the Ethiopian data survey was horrible for me to clean, but, and then we provide it to students in kind of partially clean format, so it's, so it's, they get some taste of what it's like to clean the data, but then they don't have to get into really the, the nitty gritty, so then they can kind of focus on doing the data analysis, but also get a flavor for what cleaning the data is like. Um, right, and then here's a list of the concepts that are taught in the first 12 projects. These are just concepts that recur in recur in more than one project. There's some other project, like there's some pro concepts that only appear in one or two projects, in one project, so they're not on the table, otherwise it won't fit in the slide. But you can see there's a whole range of things that you can do, and there's many different projects that you can choose. Um, so for example, if you want to do something about hypothesis testing, there's like a range of different projects. So you don't have to teach them in order, and you can pick and choose the ones that you like, and pick and choose oops, parts of the project that you like as well. Okay, so why is doing economics? Uh, so when I was speaking to Ralph about this, he said like, oh, we created something for which there isn't an immediate demand from econ lecturers. Um, although, I'm not sure how much I agree with that. <laughs> But in terms of uh, employability, um, and also from the discussion that we just had as, as a group, um, there's a general sentiment that students should do more of this stuff. And yeah, students and faculty think students should do more of this as well. So we think that the doing economics projects may become useful. So 
for example, I've talked to, for example, like Carlos was thinking of using them in his teaching as a form of assessment as well. Um, and then students, sometimes they're maybe really keen students who are interested to go more into uh, the data. They want to use the data or they want to learn how to use Excel or R. So this is a resource that you can point them to as kind of an extension. Okay, so in the same groups that you were in earlier, so thinking about how you were using empirical data, then how would you like to use data and what do you need to go from A to B? And you can also think about what I've just presented you and, may, and, how, and if or how that could help. And then we'll feed back to the group. Does anybody want to share anything that they've discussed? Um, anyone wants to go first? Brave soul. <laughs> As we speak, no? Uh, Rachel yeah. Griffith is working. Well, integrated with the core. Yes. Yeah, so that would be uh, second year econometrics course in short with the I. Ralph Becker and, and Rachel's course is excellent. There's someone here from Manchester. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, Dan, yeah. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> Ralph teaches an econometrics course in just a second year at the moment, a four year course. So I think that's a plan just to correlate yeah, that. Yeah, correct that, yeah. So the, the, the idea is to, some people here have asked about why R, and that they can't be understood. And uh, so the, the point is that R is open source, and uh, it's sort of displacing Stata, because uh, academics use Stata, but people out there in the world don't, and they're tending to use R. And kids are learning R at school, so R will take over. <laughs> Yeah, um, but yeah, since that it is it is a good point that uh, you can get students to make the data available to students. And actually to respond to that in ESPP, we do make the data for chart. I mean, there are exercises in the ESPP, the green the green ebook where it says they're titled using Excel and then the students will download a data file which contains the file used to make like the charts in the website and then they will do some exercises. Actually, I can show you an example. Where is it? SPP here. Um, so this is an easy one about growth rates um, here. 
So, oops, where is it? Yeah. So it's like calculating compound growth rates. Where is it? Oh, so for example, here, where it says download and save this spreadsheet, there's like the data. This is the data that they used to make figure 1.3, uh, which is not here. <laughs> it's, where is it? It's this hockey stick diagram here. So then they'll use that data and they'll calculate compound growth rates. And then there's a walkthrough of how to do that in Excel. So maybe that's kind of partially yeah. responding to you, your point. Um, yeah, so there are exercises in ESPP that use Excel. Not currently for core, but we're working on that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So are there any other points that people would like to make? Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, so yeah, we think the projects are quite adaptable, and Carlos will be sharing his experience with using it. Hi. Uh, my name is Carlos. I'm here to talk to you about my experience about applying one of the projects in my class. You can tell I learned a lot yesterday from Pete Bailey's <laughs> class. I'm trying to tick all the boxes here. <laughs> no. Um, OK, so <laughs> I decided quite selfishly to trial one of these projects last year in my introduction to statistics class. The idea was to see how the project went down with students, but mostly to try and motivate and engage students with the real world uh, example. I mean, I, I use real data in statistics, but I th thought climate change is such a topical um, and interesting uh, area that I thought students would really latch on to it. So, just very briefly explain what I did. I extended and adapted the climate change assignment included not just having to do a series of tasks in Excel, and, but also interpreting the data. I, I wanted really students to get their hands dirty and, and, and develop their own opinions about the topics. And it's something students really struggle with, so I said, maybe I'll force you to do that. Um, I decided, I thought about group work and indivi individual work. I think economists are not very good at working in groups, so I thought, I'll do the, the safe option and do an individual assignment. Now, there were 300 students, so it was quite a task, uh, and I'll, I'll explain some of the things I found in, 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 in a while. I gave students six weeks to do it. Um, these were first-year students, so I set it in the first week. I told them in the first lecture, you can do it any time you want, but the, the deadline is by the end of week six. So they had a lot of time to do it. Uh, of course, most students didn't start thinking about it until week five, but uh, th that's a different story. That's something that happens. So the students had to complete a series of tasks uh, following pretty much what Eileen uh, did and answering essay-type questions, very often very short, 150 words, uh, asking them to interpret the data. Um, I totaled 1,500 words altogether, so it wouldn't be too, too difficult to, to mark. Um, and I decided to make this a summative assessment. In my experience, when you make it formative, half the class does not engage. So I, I really wanted students to engage, so I set a task uh, summatively. Again, following what Eileen said, I, did, I have found over the years that a lot of our graduates, when they go to workplace and I visit students and placements, one of the most common comments I get back from both employees and students is, I wish my Excel skills were better. And so I thought, if we start in year one immediately, that might help them later on. They're going to hate me for a while, but maybe in two years' time, they'll come back and say that was really useful. It was worth 20% of the final mark. Um, I didn't want to risk too much, having too much of a weight. Interesting, in the feedback, some students complained a lot at, at the time they had to do it. Later on, they said they wished the weighting was more than 20%. So they wanted to be more than just 20%. But uh, that's how I did at the time. I did try to avoid collusion and plagiarism. This is something that happens uh, a lot. <coughs> uh, so uh, what did I do? I, I, I included the questions in Excel in a way that students had to make some choices. For example, use three non-consecutive months, and they had to choose which months they, they, they wanted. And that kind of ensured some variability here. And uh, if they had to do this two or three times, the probability of a, an exact match kind of dropped. So you, you, know, you could detect these things quite, quite uh, strongly. 
And also I included essay questions which students really struggle. You know, what is your opinion about the data? What do you think is happening? And very often they would come back and say, what do you want me to say? You know? So I want you to develop your own opinion. Look at the data, tell me what you see. But what do you think? I'm not telling you what I think. So I was really pushing them out of their comfort zone. And um, there was an interesting thing that happened. Only five students were found to have colluded. Um, and and it, they, were, they were given a zero. Not by me. I just had to assign them to the, to the committee that looks into things. They decided to fail them on the spot and give them a zero. So it wasn't my decision. I, think, I thought it was a bit harsh because they were first year students who were just collaborating. But uh, it was something that happened. Now, a few things really surprised me and really wasn't expecting, even though I've done assignments in the past. A significant proportion of students have never heard of Excel. We think that everybody knows Excel. I mean, Microsoft is kind of taking over the world. Um, I had about 60 nationalities in my classroom. That's not true. Okay, so a significant proportion never actually opened Excel before. I didn't actually teach Excel in my classes. I thought, you know, students could learn with some guidance. Um, and so there's lots of very good materials out there, and I thought, you know, you can pick it up with some instructions. I prepared a, a brief, a very detailed brief, eight pages long, with instructions, step by step, following pretty much what I, Eileen said about how to do things, click here, do that. Um, and again, students really resented having to do the research themselves. They really were expecting that the instructions alone would be enough. Because in places I would say you can just Google how to do this or you can go to YouTube and set that. And they really didn't like that. Okay, So in the end, I actually created my own content with my own description, my own voice, because that's what students expected. Okay, So that's one of the things I, I, I did. The quality of the assignments was really impressive. There was a lot of noise, a lot of students that weren't happy because I said it's too much work and I can't cope and uh, oh my god. And, uh, but once they've completed it, I was really impressed with the, the quality of the assignments. A significant proportion of students went well above and beyond what you expect the first year students to do. Extensive reading on climate change. They would bring uh, things about Kyoto Protocol, about all sorts of measures and articles and research published in the area. I was really, really impressed with the quality. The average was 69%, which was quite a good average for introduction to statistics. I mean, it's definitely higher than the average for exams. Um, I, I don't include the zeros here because otherwise the average goes down quite a bit. So that was a pleasant surprise. And only six students failed. And they failed because they really didn't engage with, with, um, with the assignment. Now, Students had to submit two files, the Excel spreadsheet and the Word document. And that was also uh, quite a problem, because a lot of students would submit the wrong file to the wrong place, and, and then they couldn't upload it, and then the internet was down. And you know, it did, did generate a lot of noise and a lot of traffic. And uh, at times, I felt like running away, but you know, it, it was OK in the end. As I said, some students complained a lot. Um, I actually saw some students for the first time in week five when they came to ask me questions about the assignment, which was a good, a good thing. I'd never seen them before. I said, well, who are you? And uh, they would ask me questions about the assignment. And after my lectures, every time, there would be a lot of people around me asking me questions about the assignment. Mostly, how do you want me to do this? A lot of questions like that. Okay? And I said, I don't care how you do it as long as you do the task. So I'm focusing on the outcome not the process. The process you do however you want. I just want the outcome completed. Excel, the, the, the struggle with Excel was something that really surprised me. A lot of students couldn't cope with formulas. They would start with an equal sign and then the formula wouldn't work and they would just freak out uh, if there was an error message or the formula wouldn't work. I did face a lot of technical issues. One was this one. There's many different versions of Excel, so you prepare careful instructions, 
And then somebody says, it doesn't work in my version because the menus are slightly different and the graphs are slightly different. And I had basically, in some parts, prepared four different versions okay, of instructions because the Mac Excel is different. And then the, this uh, 2010, 16, 13, this. So that was uh, definitely something that was difficult, but now I know, so it's a question of preparing it. Um, again, different browsers, operation systems don't work the same way. And it's really funny, because for some reason the Mac, uh, op uh, the, the browser of the Mac, which is called, what is it called? Safari, wouldn't work, the link. So it would click on the link, and it wouldn't take them anywhere. And I must have received, I don't know, 70 emails about that. You know, and, I just, and I just said, just copy the link, paste it in a different browser, and it will work. But I had to explain that, because students wouldn't use initiative, and they wouldn't ask their friend how to do it either. So very, very literal, uh, that's what I found. So some students were extremely literal, and they wanted to tell detailed instructions about everything, every single detail they wanted to know. How many decimal places should I use? I don't care. You know, <laughs> just do whatever you want. But they really wanted that. Do I have to cite? Do I have to refer? What's the everything they wanted? Uh, minute instructions. And, uh, and that was quite tiring at the end. Lots of students started to work very late. And then they resented me for not uh, helping them more. Okay? And I said, why, why did you start in week five? You know, I, I told you, you can do this in week one, it's fine. But, and then th this was difficult to manage what that, that I expected. In the end, the noise got so, so high, I stopped teaching and used one of the lectures to, uh, to answer questions. I mean, I, I had to do that. And that helped. And I created also lots of extra content for that. Marking took a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> It basically took me close to eight weeks to mark because I had to cross the Word and the Excel. And there were a lot of things that didn't work because students would, they had to submit um, the Word document to turn it in to check for plagiarism and the Excel into a Dropbox because they can't submit both. Of course, 20% of students did the, the wrong way around, so I had to chase them up. and. So that, that was, again, the inability to follow instructions really surprised me because I spent a lot of time, eight pages of instructions, and a lot of students didn't follow the instructions. So that, that really surprised me as well. So final slide, if you are thinking of embarking, <laughs> and I encourage you to. <laughs> I really encourage you to. I mean, as Eileen said, these assignments are very flexible. You can extend them, you can change them, you can adapt them. Um, a lot of students also, when they went to the NASA site, they got lost. They just, there's so much stuff here, and they couldn't find the link. And I think there's two or three versions of the file. There's a North American um, uh, data, and there's a no, North, em, Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere, and lots of students again asked about that, and I, I couldn't care less. But you know, <laughs> they thought if they chose the wrong data, they would get a zero or something. They're really panicking about assessment. So, um, so what I recommend, what have I learned, and what I do ask you to consider: create a very detailed assignment brief. I mean as much detail as you want, because that will save you lots of emails in the future. Um, I think the instructions Eileen has created are fantastic, but there will be lots of extra questions, because if it's for summative assessment, students will care a lot about this. I would even ask you to ask a former student, a PhD student, to actually follow the assignment brief and see if they can go through the instructions, because they could maybe preempt some of those emails that you're going to get. Okay, so it's worth paying, paying for someone to do this. It really definitely is. Um, create a forum for students to ask questions. Again, this saved me a lot of times. There's a lot of repetition in the questions that they are generated. And so you can just aggregate them. And whenever somebody asks you the same question for the 30th time, which you answered in the lecture like four times already, you just put the link and students can go there. I created a 
a number of YouTube videos myself, because again, they would really resent having to find this information. And to be fair on the student, there's varying quality of stuff out there about. So students often don't know where to look and what's good, what's not. So I created a few screencasts showing with movement and my voice, reassuring students, this is where you press, this is where you open, this is what comes out. And, and that really, really helped. And uh, I got lots of hits in a week. It was like 150 hits each video, at least 150. This was in week five. I was really surprised. Um, frequently asked questions page. It's something I also did. I would refresh it daily and refer students to it. Go there first. If your question is not answered, then come back to me. Okay, so final <laughs> words. It was worthwhile. Now I've come the other side of of the rainbow and uh, I feel students in the final feedback, so this was week six, a lot of noise in week five, by week 12 everybody had calmed down, the end of module feedback was very positive, the student satisfaction went up from the previous year, not just because of the assignment, I'm sure, but it couldn't have been uh, terrible, otherwise it, it wouldn't be. Um, and a lot of the qualitative comments students made mentioned the assignment uh, as, as a positive experience. As I said, some students said they actually wished it was worth more because they said, I did more work for that assignment than for everything else combined, uh, which just shows it was a, it's a very simple assignment. I mean, it's, as Eileen said, that you only need to know average, median, percentiles, and create a few diagrams. That's basically it. There's nothing complicated. There's no economics involved. And, and, and some students really, really struggle. OK, so that's, that's my experience. So next, oops. And you mentioned about the tutorial session. Yeah. Right. So we have a video that was made by Ralph and um, the R projects that he's been heavily involved in making. Hello everyone, I'm um, sad not to be with you today, but uh, I wouldn't want to miss on, out on the opportunity to tell you something about the um, R versions of the empirical projects for the core website, because I, I'm uh, just as excited about these. So let me first tell, firstly tell you a little bit about the difference between Excel and R projects, and uh, these differences are partly due to the difference between Excel and R uh, themselves. Now, R is really a programming language uh, written really to do data work, statistical analysis, and that means you have to type out what you want it to do. And that means that we will provide more walkthroughs in R than we do for the Excel versions, as we know that this is. Uh, Many people are not as used to this as uh, they are used to the work, to the way how to work in Excel. Also, some things that are really easy in Excel are actually quite difficult to achieve in R, but also vice versa. So some of the tasks, but very few, are only very slightly adjusted, just to make sure we are not making ourselves unnecessarily difficult. And uh, lastly, and I'll get to that at the end, we will provide R markdown files uh, for the R projects. So the first thing that's important to learn for any sort of uh, potential user of empirical data is that data are not clean and we have to ha have to get our hands dirty. And so you will see that many of the projects actually have tasks which ask the students to understand the nitty-gritty details, the definitions of data, which may have an impact on the actual usability of the data. But also, there are just sometimes mistakes in data, or at least, at the very least, missing data. And we have to make this visible so that users get used to dealing with these issues and don't sort of fall over these hurdles the first time they go outside any sort of textbook or example environment. Now altogether this and some of the extra points I'll, I'll explain in a moment means that data work is actually extremely tedious, difficult, annoying, frustrating, everything at the same time. But once you've overcome this you will realize that data work is incredibly rewarding and in fact 
some people may soon pay you some handy salary for the skills which you learn when you do this data work. So what will you actually see when you look at the uh, working in R project? So we're looking at the Empirical Project 1, which is going to be uh, the only R version that's going to be published in the first instance. So go to part 1.1. All the tasks are exactly the same in this information as in the Excel version, unless we have uh, very small differences. For instance, every R project starts with a walkthrough importing the data file into R, which of course, as you work into Excel and most of the data are given as Excel sheets, isn't really necessary. So what you see in these R walkthroughs is basically some explanation of what needs to be done and then with clearly highlighted uh, command lines, which of course a user should uh, save in a, in a work document uh, and uh, not just um, run on the command line in R. We'll get to this later. So here's the, uh, the import from a data file. There's some information here, for instance, about what to do with missing data, very important. Um, how to look at some data and you get some output, which is also replicated here. Uh, for instance, here, the next walkthrough is about uh, drawing a line chart. There's issues about defining data as time series data, which will make some work easier in, uh, in R, but this definition as time series data is of course something that um, in Excel doesn't have to be done so explicitly. And then there's some command to, to plot a line graph and here is the line graph. So this is what you will generally see in R and then here a little explanation of what has happened. One of the very best features of R is that it is open source and that means it's uh, free for the user. But the important aspect here is that many people will have contributed really useful pieces of code to be used by other people. In R they are called packages and we will introduce users to the use of some of these packages. For instance, in uh, walkthrough 1.4, we will use a package called Mosaic. There's no need for uh, any details here, but for instance, that package makes it very easy to create these sort of histograms broken up by some, for instance, time period here or by some other variable. So that's a very important feature and we will uh, point the user to what type of packages to use. From my experience as a lecturer in econometrics who has been trying to make his students learn R for a number of years now, the most frustrating aspect of this for students is that they come across error messages. The computer saying no. And if the computer was to just use as clear language as this, very often it doesn't use as clear language as that. We want to tell users that debugging is a perfectly normal process and happens to everyone and try to help them how to tackle such problems. Of course we can't, debugging is really something that uh, needs to be learned with experience, but uh, what we can do is at certain stages here for instance discuss with users why they get error messages and point to them um, what they ought to do to uh, tackle these. There are a number of other important features when working with R or any other programming language that uh, are important to point out to users. Uh, for instance in walkthrough 1.4 there's the issue of variable types and in particular there are sort of categorical variables in R are called factor variables. So wherever necessary we discuss little points about uh, variable types. There's also an important issue for students to learn and that is that there are always several ways of how to achieve the same thing. So here, for instance, where well, there's an issue of, create, of combining 
uh, monthly data into um, sort of a series that contain all quarterly, uh, all variables, observations in a quarter. And here we discuss two different ways to create the same variable here, temp, summer, and these are just two different ways. And where appropriate, we point this out just to make users understand that this is just a feature of programming. There's not any one right answer. And uh, lastly, a very important aspect of working in a programming language are Boolean variables. And uh, we use them at a number of occasions and explain them like we do here. Lastly, there is one very nice feature of R that we uh, endeavor to make available for students, and that's the ability to create what are called R markdown files. And we, uh, we're planning to make these available for download. So what do I mean with this? Yeah, I have a folder into which I've uploaded uh, such an R um, markdown file and the two data files used in this uh, project one. And what a user can then do is to open this R markdown file. And what the user will get is effectively all the text and the code that is in the walkthroughs. Okay, so we're going through, we're starting with walkthrough uh, the the import and data file. Import the data file into our walkthrough and here's all the code. And um, a user can then basically on their own machine run all the code directly. It's just an advanced version of copying and pasting the code. But the advantage is we don't see much value in just copying and pasting. The advantage then is that users can go into the code and see what happens to the output if you change certain things. Like what, for instance, if we change the horizontal line here from orange to purple, and we just move down the explanatory text a little bit and then you can rerun this code and you get just a slightly different in this case um, image uh, but at the same time you can change statistics you calculate or if you have lots of variables just change the variable for which you want to do some things and you can very easily do that right in the code we think this may become a very valuable feature for uh, users of the doing economics uh, page. So this was all I wanted to say with respect to uh, to the R versions of the projects. I hand you now back to uh, my co-presenters. Right, so that was Ralph talking about the, um, the R versions of the projects and giving a walk through the R part of the site. Um, so what else? Yeah, so the types of units in which to use the projects are clearly statistics units, but there's other examples. So, you know, implied economics classes or anything to do with data or research skills. So as the recurring theme of these projects is that they're very flexible and they're very adaptable. So there's many different contexts in which you can use them. Right, so in terms of employability, so how to motivate students to do them. So Carlos already talked about how to uh, do that in practice, but uh, in general, there's feedback that employers do value Excel and data analysis skills. And uh, as Carlos's example showed, there's students who wish that they were better prepared and how better to motivate them that, than to make that part of their course grade. Um, so having, if possible, like you could invite recent alumni or students who did placements to talk in class or have a video like we just showed you of Ralph talking, but have the student talking about how useful it was. Because um, sometimes if students are afraid of math or afraid of statistics, then they don't want to do it. Um, so one feature that I haven't really mentioned is that if they're doing economics projects, they're very, they're very non-technical. So we don't, for example, show students formulas. So we explain standard deviation in terms of spread. 
um, and measure, and the mean is sort of like the central tendency, but we don't give them form, we don't show the mathematical formulas to the students. So of course, if you want to bring those technical elements into your teaching, you can, but we've left them out um, so that it's accessible to anybody, as I said, who just has GCSE math grade C, so they don't have to know calculus. Um, Right, so there's still things that are under our development. So the first one is there's macro, we're thinking of doing macro projects uh, to accompany the units in the economy. So since I'm a micro person, so there's any, if there's any suggestions on what to include, so we're probably going to include things on forecasting, um, but there's many projects then potential areas that we could look at, so we always welcome suggestions. Um, and also, as Ralph said, he walked you through one project, which is the only one available at the moment. That's unit for, sorry, that's project one. Uh, but there will be R versions for every project in the final release, and w those are in progress at the moment. And again, solutions for every project. So the nine um, projects that are up now, some of them don't have solutions. I think there's only the, f there's the first five. So that should be plenty for you to work with. Uh, but there will be solutions for every project, rest assured. Um, right. So this is that's the that's all that we wanted to say. So if there's any questions um, that you have, we're happy to answer them. And for once, we finished on time, so uh, yeah. we've got plenty of time for questions. <laughs> yes. Um, so Alvin. Um, it seems to me that this, these projects. Alvin. I think uh, a really conducive environment for teaching these projects would be a kind of workshop environment where students are working in groups and might help to deal with some of the mm. questions that you got. I mm. mean, you know, they seem to be ideally sort of set up for that. Um, no, no. So uh, just a comment, really. That's a very good point. Um, I don't know how things are here at Bristol, but those kind of rooms are in, in very high demand, yeah. so it's sometimes difficult to actually book it for for your course for the entire ground. But uh, I agree, I mean, if, if you can get them. Yeah. But it depends whether you do it formative or summative, so that's something you have to take into account. Um, really just to comment on, on Carlos, I mean, I think you possibly undersold it, by te particularly the eight reference to taking eight weeks to market. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, because I, I think what you did was noble, and I think I've done similar things, not quite as ambitious as you've, as you've done. And I think, I would say, from somewhat bitter experience having done it over several years, I think you're actually just being too nice to your students. Um, I, I, for example, we, we used to have paper submission of projects. We moved to electronic submissions. But then we would get it in all sorts of formats. And so I said, from, uh, from this year, I said, you will submit in a PDF file one document. And if it isn't in a single PDF file, we will not mark it. And miraculously, they submitted PDF files. I mean, a few of them submitted Word files, but, you know, nearly all of them did. And, and you know, I think it, it's sort of... Th you're right that the, 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 the default is to sort of say, please tell me how to do this. But it's sort of paradoxical, because this is the computer games generation. Mm -hmm. If you go into a new computer game, there are no instructions. You have to find out how to play the game. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, it, it, the modern world is like that. Mm -hmm. The, mo the, you know, the modern world is, you know, if, if you don't know how to do something, you Google it. You go on Wikipedia. And I think they need to be told this is, that mm -hmm. it's a sink and si there is an element of sink and swim about the world. It's, it is like these computer games. If you don't find out the rules, you're going to be killed. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, and they do, they will find out those rules. But, I mean, obviously you need, I mean, you do need to deal with the fact that some people are starting from such a low base. And I can, I can see that possibly if you were doing it again, you wouldn't, no. you, you know, you would maybe make sure that there was some more remedial teaching available for the people starting from such a low base. Uh, but I think, I think you can, I think it, it, it is actually important to say to people, I'm not going to tell you how to do this. You've got to find this out. Yeah. Because um, the information is there. Um, and some of them will do better than others at finding it out, but that is, that is, you know, that's a, a very important learning process for them. Yeah. You know, if they go to their boss saying, you've got to tell me how to do every single stage of this process, their boss is going to be really pissed off. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree. I agree. Um, we, uh, we're actually going to have the, our teaching day tomorrow. So I think that's going to be part of the discussion, how we treat students and, and how we babysit them or not. And I'm all for tough love. But, you know, I, this was the first time. It was no, a trial. I, 
So I was one other point on the eight weeks marking. I mean, it, it's very difficult, but one thing I have done is I've set Excel tasks where they then have to go on Moodle and plug in some numbers in Moodle, which they can only get by doing the Excel task. So then it's the marking is automated. So if you design a task mm -hmm. for so at least some of what they do, mm -hmm. it, 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 can be, it can be automated marking. Yeah. And, 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 and never involves you looking from a Word file to an Excel file. Everything mm -hmm. that's from the Excel file that's relevant to the document needs to be cut and pasted into the document so you can see it. Yeah. Even if it's, you, you know, they know that you can check it, but it's just, yeah. again, I've had that of, of multiple documents. It's horrendous. You've yeah. got to say one document. Yeah. Well, th thanks for the advice. Um, it was partly because I want var variability across students. I didn't want every student to do the same task that I did this. The original plan was to have a, a team of TAs helping me with the marking. Um, but because it was highly subjective, it was really difficult to come up with a, a marking criteria grid yeah. that I could give my TA and say, this is how you mark this. Partly also because the quality was really good. So I, I really wanted to give good feedback. So I, I decided to invest the time. And at the time, I resented it because, you know, I, we're all very busy. Um, but I, I, I learned a lot from the experience as well. I mean, mm -hmm. I learned from my students. They often introduced uh, comments about papers and research which was published, which I didn't know about climate change. It's not my area. They made some very good points. And it, it was actually a pleasure. It was just, if it was 30 students, it wouldn't have been a problem. Mm -hmm. It was very self-inflicted, let's say. It was <laughs> self-inflicted pain. I would, I would do it slightly differently next time. Uh, I would probably focus more on the Excel skills. Uh, but again, I, I think the students did a lot of very quality learning during the experience. I, I took students out of their comfort zone and forcing them to develop their own opinions about the data, I think was really valuable. They really struggled. They were really uncomfortable. But the result was really good. I really, really enjoyed it. And you know, not everybody agreed that climate change is real. I mean, there were students making all sorts of points, which I didn't agree with, but, uh, you know, <laughs> fair enough. But at least they tried to justify their opinions with, with, with research and, you know, data and all sorts. We have another question yep. over here. Uh, thanks. It was just a comment, really, just because I, I also run a project, Excel project, and crime and inequality or climate change. and. Um, I agree, it's really surprising how many don't have Excel, basic Excel skills. Lots of the students afterwards would always say that project was one of the most immediately, obviously, useful thing that they did in their first mm -hmm. year. Um, but also that I did it a lot and I got a lot tougher and grumpier mm -hmm. in the sense of like having one of the most useful things I found was having a 72 hour blackout before submission where I'm not dealing with any questions. Mm -hmm because the, the avalanche of what's this data about, what do I have to do sort of thing, you just cut that out of your life and it makes it, mm. it makes it. So again, it's just that thing about learning as you, as you go along. But this, I, I really applaud it, the yeah. students always. Uh, yeah. and, and another thing was, yeah, have to submit the report, I had to submit the Excel file, but I only ever went to it if there was something really weird in the report. Other than that, I wouldn't look at the Excel files at all. So that made marking a bit easier, but it's still hard. No, I, I mean, I, was, I, I totally agree, and, and again, I know better. It's just I was so invested in the project. I, I really want to make sure that people performed well, they, you know, it worked well. I'm really strict in terms of exams. I mean, I've got the, the 72, well, 48 hour, which I, I actually put it out of office message. I'm not in. Uh, so I, I, I can be very strict. I'm not always this nice guy who does everything students ask him to. But it's just because it was the first time yeah, you know I actually felt myself that some of the instructions were not as clear as they should have been. Uh, but some of the questions were absolutely silly. I mean, does the line have to be orange? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's just the noise. It was, it's just basically I've got 300 students. And if there is a little question 300 times, it generates a lot of traffic. But it was self-inflicted. I realized it was self-inflicted. Yeah. First, I think this is a fantastic project, and it's really just amazing uh, what you've done. Uh, and I think it's novel, and there's nothing quite like it. And I worry a little bit about that, because as one of you said, this could be a project without a market. Uh, and it's true that there isn't any obvious 
body or a person who absolutely has to have this. So I wonder what you're thinking or what we all could collectively think about the diffusion of this project as a very aggressive and active thing to do because it's, it's not a standard product and therefore we have to think of other ways of, of diffusing it. Ask Andy to maybe say something about that. So thank you, thank you, Andy. So I, I mean, it, it, this resonates really, really well with the Q-step agenda of, of mm. Nuffield, of course. And so I think there's an there is a market for this. Andy, maybe people won't know what. Ah, okay. Sorry. So Q-step is an initiative, about twenty million pounds of initiative, uh, behind Nuffield, ESRC, and and Hefke which has been running for about the last five years that a number of institutions, Manchester being an example, Sheffield where I'm from is, is another. There are about 18 mm -hmm. institutions across the UK, mm -hmm. uh, Exeter mm -hmm. another one, which um, has a focus on trying to bring more quantitative social sciences to the fore. So um, economics, us, were excluded from from the QSTEF initiative for being already quantitative um, enough or at least engaged quantitatively. And so this was a program that was focused particularly on the non-economic social sciences in an attempt to get them to embrace more quantitative work. And, uh, and I think these projects absolutely speak to that market and that <coughs> audience because there is, there is nothing like this out there. I think, I think we're absolutely right to, 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 to kind of worry, but also we should celebrate this because I think this is exactly the kind of resource that the Nuffield Quick Q-Step Centers would really embrace. I think if I had one small criticism, it's that you've called it doing economics because do we really need to be doing core or any other form of economics to get the learning outcomes out of these exercises, I, the one on climate change, I fear no. not. I, I think I don't need to be an economist to be mm. interested and worried and you know, engaged in the issue of climate change. And looking through the list of topics, many of these aren't economic mm. topics, are they? They're doing social science. Mm. And that's the audience, I think, that you can aim at very effectively. And Nuffield, who are currently evaluating Q-Step 1 um, with a view of perhaps extending it to a Q-Step 2 initiative, broadening the agenda to maybe arts and humanities, maybe other, you know, embedding it in more institutions, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure would absolutely celebrate this as a resource to support the agenda that they have in getting more social scientists, our, our friends in, in sociology and in, in, in social geography, in political science and so on, mm. to do exactly these kinds of exercises, mm. getting their hands dirty with real data, mm. looking at real social issues, and understanding how we can become, not data scientists, but critical consumers of data. That's mm. where the agenda is, I think. And, and this is a, a really good set of exercises which will give students an opportunity to make that first step mm. along that pathway of becoming critical consumers of data. There's more data than ever out there, isn't it? We, we need people to use it sensibly and recognize the abuse of the use mm. of data um, in, in everything they see, in the media, in, 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 in research, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think mm. this is where the, the value of these exercises are. I think you may put people off because you've called it mm. doing economics because this is the audience which aren't doing mm. economics. And so I think that may be perhaps a bit of a marketing miss. I'll, I'll let Eileen. There's a few more questions. Maybe if, if we get, or would I'll, you like? I'll, to... I'll probably forget about it. Okay. That's only fun. Okay. Accepted it. Just a small <laughs> suggestion. Seeing that the project is called economics as a social science, why couldn't we make a small change and call it doing economics as a social science? At least that would partially address that concern without fundamentally changing the name. And now, who would like to pay for this mic? <laughs> Um, I was just going to uh, comment very, very <coughs> quickly, and then I'll pass to Eileen. Um, I, I totally agree with what you said. I mean, in my core, Introduction to this Statistics course, I think I've got students from 28 different programs, and the way they addressed the, the, the assignment was quite noticeably different, depending on your background. So that, that was a really interesting, and maybe you can call it doing data analysis instead of data doing economics or something. Um, yes, I agree with that. But it, it, I would put, it, I would put a call. challenge there. One <laughs> way to divulge these projects might be to create a competition among students. They have to 
after doing the assignment, they have to create a one or two page, you know, summary, executive summary about, you know, th what they found in the data and do uh, some kind of competition among students who are doing core. Yeah. Just, just an idea. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, I think doing economics was, I think, the lesser of two evils because we initially were going to call it something like doing statistics, but uh, social science <laughs> students are even more afraid of statistics than they are of economics. So it, it's gone a bit. <laughs> yeah, we, we're, we're, it's still a work in progress, so very much a work in progress. So any suggestions are always welcome. Uh, my question was for Carlos, really, um, and it's not really about the project, more about the timing of the project mm. and how that worked and how sort of your colleagues felt about it in terms of the first six weeks having something summative. And did that sort of take a lot of focus towards your unit in regards to focus away from other units? And, or was that not an issue? Yeah. But it is always an issue because whenever there's a deadline, students stop going to any lectures. I mean, we, we notice that because that becomes the, the uh, massive part. It was partly my fault. I really thought this was an assignment a student could do in a couple hours. I thought, you know, it's a, a few Excel, a few graphics, you know, 1,500 words. You can do it in an afternoon. Um, and I think most students did. It was a quick assignment, but some of them left it to the last minute. So the, the challenge is to actually have students engaging with the content early on. Uh, we, all, we, we all have the problem that first-year grades do not count towards the final mark. They just want to pass, so that's something working against us. But nevertheless, if a student engaged properly, it's not an issue. It's not a problem, and it doesn't affect other modules at all, I, in my opinion. But in this case, it did, because there's a deadline. They stopped doing everything else. I mean, that's, that's something we all know. Uh, in response to uh, Sam's question about where the market is for this, I just wanted to um, make the point that there's interest in this course within government because the government's social and economic research unit is interested in adopting it or adapting it um, for government social researchers. And then at the ONS, um, the GSS, Government Statistical Service, have also an interest in it. I know we've got a colleague here from the ONS. I don't know whether you've connected with this at all or from well, a different I'm part. I'm a member of GES, so I don't have these statistics. Oh, GES, right, that. sorry. I don't have a statistical background, okay. but I suppose in terms of the market, I was quite shocked, uh, both in the kind of group conversation and wider feedback, uh, that Excel is not at a high level for 18-year-olds today. Mm -hmm. I, in my day, it was a lot more, much more variable, cause I, but I assume today... Uh, it was much higher, and I think that's probably an information gap on our perspective because, you know, if if people if the students don't have an understanding of Excel, then they certainly won't have an you know uh, experience of working with actual economic data. And I think that's mm -hmm. something um, kind of look at your walkthroughs. I think there's something I'm kind of taking away in terms of promoting that. Um, so I think mm -hmm. this stuff really cool. If anything that gives you experience in an applied way, because uh, I just can't think of any professional economist role where you're just not working with data. Uh, particularly at a junior level, because that's sort of, you know, one of my kind of regrets these days. I don't get to work with data as much as I used to, yeah. um, so I can be in meetings a lot more. Um, so I think, yeah, I would also support mm. the project work done, especially given the, uh, the variable quality it seems in Excel and Excel application knowledge. Yeah. No, it's, it's a difficult line to achieve in terms of that, because in the past, like a few years ago, I had an assignment, and all the tutorials were in the computer lab. And I was showing students step by step how to do it. Press this, open this menu, go that. And students were really bored. And in the end, they didn't know how to interpret the data any better. They would know, they would, could follow the instructions what I was showing on the big screen. But you, know, you ask them, what does this mean? They still couldn't answer. So uh, it, it's a difficult balance how you invest your time. Um, but I agree, maybe some tough love is, is the way forward. You know, it just, uh, ask students to grow up a bit and uh, <laughs> develop their skills themselves. But uh, uh, um, I do feel sometimes you give them the data, the graph, or just the time series, and they don't know what to interpret. They really don't know what to make of it. I was just going to add to that that we're also interested in talking to um, teachers in schools, um, both economics teachers and social science teachers. But um, if anybody's got any other ideas about avenues we can pursue for um, the kind of students or the kind of teachers that would be interested, then please get in touch with the core office. Okay, so I don't know if you would like 
Any other comments, questions? Well, one more, okay. One just clarification, really. We talked about the problem of students having Excel. Have, has anyone got experience of people trying to cope with R uh, from scratch? Because I was intimidated by that. Um, We've got someone over there. Do yeah. students actually cope? So, yeah, on our um, modern social science degree program, sponsored by Nuffield, put that in very quickly. Um, <laughs> we, we sat and had to make the decision about what software we would encourage students to take on. And we're a big university, we've got everything, so it's a choice, it's not a constraint thing. And, and, and as was said earlier, we recognise, and you just got to look at the usage figures, that R is where it's at, it's growing very quickly, the online community is very strong and very helpful. I, you know, the, the, you know, it is a very sympathetic community. Sometimes some of the other communities status is okay, but sometimes it can be a bit brutal to new users, I think. Uh, but the R online community is very sympathetic. And so we plump for our, for our students and our experience is that they make very, very rapid progress, in mm -hmm. fact. Um, we use it universally. We use it for data visualization in the first semester of the first year. So, you know, it, it, they really do have to hit the ground running. We use it for the, the quants projects. We have quants projects at every level, level one, level two, and level three. And so by the time they get to the third year, actually, they're quite competent users of R. Are all your notes ready to be available? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I don't, luckily, teach all of these modules. But, um, you know, the students, the students haven't found it a big problem. No. There are some nice introductory guides. There's a nice one R for biosciences, actually. That's a really nice slim line thing. But, but actually, students are very good. You, you were saying earlier, you know, if, you, if you pick up a new... In the olden days, you, every piece of software and every new electronic device came with a huge instruction manual. And I kind of miss that, you know, because I'm, I'm a bit of a... You know, I would read those things cover to cover. But nowadays, <laughs> nowadays that isn't how it's done, is it? Software doesn't come with instruction manuals. Uh, new electronic gizmos, a new phone doesn't come with a big instruction manual. People just kind of learn by doing. And, you know, you can't break it. And students are used to growing up in that environment. And so we found that actually they just get on with it. And if it doesn't work, it comes up with an error message, they try the next thing. And, and although they talk to each other, which actually I want to encourage, you know, group work... <laughs> It's, you know, they hate group work, mm. and one way in which we can get them to interact and engage with each other is to present them with problematic things like how do you program in R, and somebody will, and you know, it, it kind of breaks down some of those barriers as well, especially when you've got different nationalities together for whom culturally sometimes it's difficult to admit that you can't do something. Mm. So actually, I found it a very positive thing, and have been surprised at how quickly they are able to assimilate and get to quite a reasonable standard in something which can look very intimidating. Mm. They've all got laptops, they can all download it themselves, it's very easy to get access to it. And then actually, just let them fly. I, I, I think, I think you know, we shouldn't underestimate this, our students. I, I think sometimes mm. you know, we can challenge them, and you know, this mm. thing about nannying them and, mm. and a bit of tough luck and so on. I think here's an example where actually <coughs> challenging them, they will rise to that challenge. Because it's not an unfamiliar experience. There is no manual, as it were. Actually, there is a manual. Yeah, you, they, they can access that. It's all online, and they get on with it. I think we've run out of time. Yeah, I don't know if there's a, well, you would like to comment. Wendy, yeah. did you want to? OK. One quick question. I find those. I find these two statements very contradictory, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm puzzled. Uh, how can it be that they find Excel challenging and R non-challenging? I mean, <laughs> both things cannot be true simultaneously. And so there's, there's something very strange in going on in here. No, I think in the case of Excel, it's, it's, it's more that they've never encountered before. And, 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 and sometimes they've got to learn it very, very quickly. Um, we provide... Uh, courses on it in Excel, uh, but they are on first come, first serve basis, so there's not, not no room for everybody else. And actually, m this project showed a massive gap in, in our offer, which needs to be plucked. Um, but it was mostly because I didn't anticipate that. I, I really did not anticipate that people would struggle calculating an average or, you know, plotting a line graph. I really did not anticipate Do that. We go straight? 
Okay. But so also I it depends on the type of students, because I've got sociology students, I've got all sorts of students which might find it harder. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So I think that's partly it, but also I, I maybe I've, I've got much smaller groups. Yeah. I think that's the other thing. So it's much more intensively taught in a lab session, or our teaching takes place in a computer lab where all students have their own PC. Right. Mm. So I think that's another issue as well as about resourcing. Yeah. Um, but numbers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Should we close? I, I fear, trickle down. Is the year ahead teaching the year behind? We've been doing that with Stata, which never, you know, has such a steep learning curve compared to R. So R can certainly do that. And also, um, you can use R Studio, the uh, free part of it, yes. that of course is meant to sucker us into paying for it, and some of us will, but the students can use it as a, a framework so it, you get a quicker startup. And I don't know of any other than Stata. Say that has the worst startup time I know. You actually have to sit there in class first. People, you can download our studio on your iPhone and play with it. It warns you it's only a toy, but it's a nice toy. So. <laughs> we, we, we do that. We, do, we use our studio, which is a more kind of friendly, basic kind of front end. Yeah. Yeah, and the video that Ralph, where Ralph was showing you, that was our studio. So. Okay, then, I think. Thank you. Uh, that was a great session. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you.